Hello everybody and welcome back to the free online woodworking school where we aim to take your woodworking skills to the next level. In today's video, we're getting that door hinged. Let's get going. Okay, so at the end of the last video, I gave you a little call to action to watch my video on how to tune hinges. That includes filing the edges, squaring the ends, cleaning up the faces, and just making sure they work exactly as intended. Because if you buy these things as standard from just a DIY supplier, they're not gonna be easy to install and you're not gonna be able to get that consistent shadow gap and whole manner of other problems. However, with just a little bit of TLC, these will work exactly the same as those high-end Brusso hinges. Saying that, if you are using Brusso or any other high-end premium hardware, then you probably don't need to go through this stage. They should be ready out of the box. But if you wanna save a little bit of money next time, get yourself some cheap hinges, watch the video on how to tune them up and uh, you'll be laughing. And so I've already been through that whole process between filming the last video and now. So these are all ready to go. We're not gonna to be touching on it whatsoever. We're gonna get straight into installing these. So to start with, we might as well get this out of the way now. It doesn't really matter which side you hinge the door on. It's completely up to you. For me, I'm gonna be doing it on the left side, but then I've heard plenty of arguments you should do it on the right side because primarily people are right-handed and they'll want to open the door that way. And it's a lot easier to open it as a right-handed than twist your arm this way. But up to you, it doesn't matter. So generally, when installing hinges, you want the top of the hinge to be in line with the bottom of the rail. It just looks nicely balanced when you do it like that. So to start with, we're gonna get a pencil and do a very, very faint mark, squaring that inside edge of the rail across the style. And then after that, we're going to number each hinge to correspond with the face on the door. So I'm gonna make this A up here, and it'll be B here. And then on the back of the hinge itself, because it's brass, you can just do it with a knife and scratch on an A. Same again down here. And you might have noticed I've done A here on the leaf that only has two pins on it. The one that's attached to the carcass has three pins. And this is generally the way you want to go about it because it will help resist that door from sagging. So we've done exactly the same on B here. So then we'll offer A up to that line and we'll put another pencil line at the bottom, very faint just to give ourselves some boundary lines and the same again with B. This will ensure we don't scratch that marking gauge too far up the door. Next, we need to fit the door into the carcass with all the shims in place and get that locked in. And then we'll carefully carry those lines across to the carcass as well. And we'll just take all those shims out and get the door out of position again. And we'll square those lines to be on the side of the door as well and then also the inside of the carcass. Okay, and then with the line squared along the front and down the sides of both the door and the carcass, it's now time to start introducing some marking gauge lines. So to begin with, we're gonna take the thickness of one of the leaves of these hinges, and you're aiming to get that set to exactly the same thickness, no overhang, no underhang. And so then with that measurement locked in, we're gonna scratch that between the boundary lines on the front of the door and on the front of the carcass coming in from the inside between those boundary lines again. And just to make sure you're on the right track, this is what you should have at the end of it. So two boundary lines and then two marking gauge lines scratched down the front of the cabinet on both the top and also the bottom. And so now we know how far the hinges go into the sides widthways. Next, we've got to sort out how far they go in to the depth. And you do that by setting the marking gauge from the leaf to the midpoint of the pin. And we're gonna scratch that in from the front of the door between those boundary marks again. And then same again, coming in from the front of the cabinet, scratch in between those boundary lines. And so that's what you should be left with on the front of the cabinet thin marking gauge line down the front and then the deeper one on the inside. And then same on the door, thin one on the front and then the slightly deeper one on the side of the door. Okay, and then the final thing to do before cutting any of this out is to turn those boundary lines that we penciled on into knife lines so that we can put a chisel into them later on. So the easiest way I find to do this is start on the line that you squared around from the rail to begin with. Put your knife into that mark, slide a square up to it and then knife back. Do not move that square. Instead, grab the corresponding hinge, lay A on there up against the edge of the square and then scratch down the other side. And with that mark, put your knife into that mark and then square it back. 
And now we've got two lines on here we can work back to. We've got the one that's scratched in the pencil line and you can see that knife line, it was just short of the pencil line. So it's a good thing we didn't just go and cut into that pencil line because it would have been wrong. But that will give you an incredibly accurate and tight fit now. Same again for B, start in the line that's in line with the rail, scribe it back, get hinge B in position and then scribe that back. And we're only doing this on the door for the time being. Don't worry about doing it on the cabinet for now. And then with those lines, just give yourself a little mark on the front edge as well. You can just slice that in at 45 degrees and it should meet up with that line that you scratched in before. And we'll get the door into position again and then very carefully put a mark on the carcass where those horizontal lines intersect with it. And then get those scribed on the inside. and then begin chopping it out. So for this, I'm gonna do a series of chops across the grain like this, and we're gonna be stopping shy of either end by about a millimeter and stopping shy of this long edge by about a millimeter every time we take one of these chops. After we've cleared out that waste in the middle, that's where we'll commit to chopping into these lines and clean out the corners. Okay, so the majority of the waste is now cleared out and you can use a router plane to flatten the bottom if you want, but I tend to just do it with a chisel and it's now time to start going back to those lines. I tend to work my way back to the shorter lines first, being sure to get right up into the corner here. And then when I come to chop this back wall, the grain's already severed in the back corners here, so it shouldn't split any further. So that's the hinge mortises on the side of the door sorted. Now we've got to do the ones inside the cabinet. And this is going to be tricky because we've got restricted access in here. A more sensible way of doing this probably would have been to cut these before assembling the whole cabinet while these bits were still loose. It may have been slightly difficult to get it aligned with the inside of the rail, seeing as this door wouldn't have even been made by that point. But as long as it was in the ballpark, it probably would have looked okay. I guess the only trouble with doing it in here before even having the door made would be that you have to reset that marking gauge twice to do this one and also to do the depth of the hinge. Ideally, you want to keep the marking gauge at one set distance and do it all together exactly as I just showed you. And so for this, if you've got butt chisels, you might be able to fit them in there. I've actually taken the handles off my Lee Nielsen chisels and that will give me access to maybe square down these corners, but that still doesn't give me a lot of room above it to hit it with a mallet. I guess another nice way to do this would be with some draw lock chisels. Lee Nielsen do a set, they're kind of like this right angle S-shaped chisel and you could just hook it in there, hit it from above with a hammer and then, yeah. That'd be a lot easier. The way I'm gonna do this, I reckon, is recreate those cross grain strikes with the chisel, but do it with a knife instead. This would be a lot easier if you had a really heavy duty Japanese marking knife. Because although I love these Swan Morton blades for just general marking out, they're not too good for hacking out waste like this. back wall I'm going to put it in there so the bevel's in first and angle the chisel up so the bevel's going down vertical give it a few small taps and again I have severed the grain either side of that to ensure it doesn't split outside of the hinge mortise I won't lie, that was quite difficult to do, but we got there in the end. And so with them fitting in there nicely, I then get a sharp pencil and I draw a circle around where those screw holes are. And I do this instead of getting an awl in there and marking the center now, because it's quite difficult to see what you're doing. It's a lot easier if you just have the circles on their own to work with, and then you just go for it from there. And with those circles, mark right in the center of them, but just ever so slightly back towards the inside of the cabinet. This will ensure that when the screws go in, it will pull the hinge backwards, but it's such a minuscule amount you move it backwards, it's not even noticeable. Essentially, just make sure it's closer to the inside of the cabinet than it is the front. And 
And so to attach these hinges, I'm going to be using these tiny brass screws. Now I don't really like brass screws because the heads on them shear very easily with a little bit too much force of the screwdriver. But when you're buying screws, just make sure that the heads of the screws actually recess within the hinge. If they're poking out whatsoever, that hinge is not going to be able to close. If you really need to though, you can countersink out the hinges a little bit more because it is just brass and most countersinks are able to do that. But just watch out for damaging that knuckle on the inside edge. I actually caught it here. And so I'm gonna try and blend that in with some sort of abrasive later. So I'm gonna be using a two millimeter pilot drill for this and that will go in those all marks but your drill bit should definitely be sized to the screws that you intend on using if you're not sure how to do that have a look at my video on how to screw wood correctly there'll be a link to that in the supporting resources below So when inserting brass screws, you've got to be incredibly careful that you don't apply too much torque to the screw because you will just shear that head off and then you'll get all the thread stuck in that hole. It is a horrible situation to be in. If you do find yourself in that situation, I find the best way to deal with it is to simply drill it out. And then with that larger hole that's left over, plug it with a dowel, glue it in place, and then re-drill it. And ideally, if you have a steel screw that matches the thread on here, you can actually use that to tap the inside of the thread first, bring it out, and then insert your brass one afterwards. However, I can't find a thread that actually matches this, and so I'm pretty much gonna have to go in with the brass screw itself and just be super careful. However, whether you have a steel screw or not, I would always recommend putting a little bit of candle wax or machine wax on the thread of that brass screw, just to cut down on the friction a little bit. And it may take a few times to insert it and remove it. Okay, that's getting a little bit resisty there. So I'm gonna take it out again. Reapply some candle wax to the thread, because that'll help push more to the bottom of this hole. All right, there we go. There's the hinges installed. And so you can see, this is the gap that's caused by the leaves not sitting flush with one another with these cheap hinges. And that is why we didn't quite take off all the material required to take this door down to fit. Because you can see at the moment, it's not quite closing. I need to take a little bit more material off the width in order to match this shadow gap here. And we've given ourselves a little bit of opportunity to take down a bit more material on the top and also the bottom to match the shadow gap that's going up here. And so this is the exact position I was hoping to be in. The door fits, it's not binding top and bottom, and we've just got to take off a little bit of material to make that shadow gap even. And so the way I'm gonna tackle this is find myself another shim that fits down the gap created by the hinges perfectly. In this case, it is two sheets of veneer, which indicates that this gap is actually about a millimeter wide, which is a little bit more than I anticipated, to be honest, but it's not a problem. It will look really nice when that's all even. And so now we're gonna to need to remove this door again and resize the door according to this new shim by taking material off these remaining three sides. Shouldn't need too much though. The other thing you may want to do on this outer edge of the door is plane a small relief angle on it to make it easier to close and less likely to have that back corner catch on the inside of the cabinet. So essentially the front corner will have that one millimeter gap. This one will be dropped back ever so slightly from that. And there you go guys that is how you hinge your door so in summary yes it's very difficult all right but simply taking your time using sharp tools and constantly checking your progress 
with these shims. Don't just start hogging off material, hoping for the best because you're not gonna achieve a good fit. If you're constantly checking everything, you will eventually achieve something like this. And as for that shadow gap, just make sure it's even on all four sides. When I first learned how to hinge a door, I didn't like the concept of having a millimeter gap surrounding the door. I was in the mindset of it needed to be a tight, seamless fit, but actually, when you do that, you realize how weird that actually is. And having the shadow gap there is actually quite normal to our eyes. So anything in the realm from half a millimeter to a millimeter shadow gap, to be honest, you can even get away with more if it's even, of course. But yeah, take your time with it. There's plenty of supporting resources below this video if you need help with specific stages of this. But we're gonna call this episode there. So as always, thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please don't forget to press the like button, subscribe if you haven't already, and you can move on to the next lesson by clicking the button below. I'll see you there.